transcendence, Jehovah, Lucifer, and Satan, three distinct and separate patterns of reality, yet each, to some extent, is present in each one of us. First, the knowledge that man has rejected his God and demanded the blood of his fellow man and that now he must suffer the consequences of his sin at the hand of his God. Then, the knowledge of the evil of war, of the degradation of human self-destruction, of the pain and the suffering, the deprivation and the miserable despair. And finally, the knowledge of irrevocable commitment to the way of the bloodshed, the plow to which man has put his hand and cannot turn back until he has completed the cycle of his own self-destruction through war. No one of these three is more real than any of the other two, except in the mind of the individual. The acceptance of the reality of all of them is the ultimate truth, the complete understanding of the triangular conflict which exists in every one of us. In adherence to the one and rejection of the other two, there is courage, but it is a blind courage, a part acceptance but equally a part rejection of reality. To cling to one pattern only and resist the others brings no resolution and no fulfillment because the knowledge is incomplete. Only by a full understanding and acceptance of all these three patterns as parts of ourselves can we begin to rise above the driving need to pursue only one of them in the face of the powerful and agonizing pressures of the other two combined. Clear vision of all three brings detachment and peace of mind because it brings the full knowledge of reality, which is truth. But though to follow one pattern and deny the presence in ourselves of the other two is blindness, to reject all three is the ultimate rejection. That is not only blindness, but cowardice as well to deny the reality of war, except as a minor evil caused and propagated by others than ourselves, for which we are not responsible, and which we are fast eliminating by the presence of our own deniable sanity. It is total blindness. To reject the validity of the preacher of doom, the Jehovian, and the preacher of peace, at all costs, the Luciferian, and the preacher of violence is the only way to end the cycle of violence to which we're committed, Satanist, to reject all three and hope that the whole unpleasant situation will right itself, to reduce the significance of war, to reduce the importance of violence in our lives, to pass all responsibility for the fact of war onto others, to belittle the effect of war upon the world, to condemn all forms of extreme attitude to war, these are the ways of blindness and cowardice. This is the way of the gray force. For all the apparent outward prevalence of this last attitude to war, its power is no more, no more real than its pretensions. Because the patterns of the gods are untouched by the images of the fearful, concealed though they may be behind facades of optimistic fantasy, their effects are unknown. The power of Jehovah, of Lucifer, and of Satan is the dominant power, and conflicted though they may be for the purpose of the gift. Upon one matter, they are in total agreement, which means that on this matter, all human beings are equally in total agreement, hard though they may try to hide it, even from themselves. And that matter is the fact of the end, the end of the world as we know it, the end of humankind, as we know it, the end of human values, as we know it, the end of human endeavors, human creations, human ambitions, human patterns of life, human conventions, human laws, and human customs as we know it. On one thing, the gods are in agreement. All these shall be destroyed to make way for a new age and a new way of life.
Jehovah. In the beginning there was war, and after there was war, then war again and more war, since man demanded control of his own destiny. He has set out ruthlessly to destroy himself. Man, I gave you a law by which you should live with respect to your fellow man. I said to you, thou shalt not kill. For in those days you were my beloved creation. Even after the fall of Adam, which had to be. You were my beloved creation built in the image of myself and set upon the earth to glorify my name unto God who reigns above me, above the universe and above all things. And I commanded you respect of one another. I commanded you that your image was sacred and must not be destroyed. And I warned you of the universal law. I said, Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in my image did I create you, and you shall without choice abide by the universal law. An eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. And you shed the blood of your own kind, and your own kind shed your blood in recompense, and his own kind shed his blood, and on in accordance with a law that cannot be overruled. And you took no heed, no heed of my command, nor of my warning, and you brought about the spiral of war. Yet, I was merciful. I fought your wars for you. You were trapped in a web of your own making, and I took pity on you sanctified your wars. I fought against your enemies because still I loved you. And still I hoped to save you from the web. Yet I also demanded peace and demanded that you live in harmony together with your fellow man. I brought your enemies to you in supplication and pleaded for your mercy. And you did not listen. Finally, all was spent, and all my words and threats and terrors and passed aside, ignored, rejected, finally, when I knew no more how to force my laws upon you, I came in love to Christ. Love thine enemy, I cried. Do good to them that hate you. If a man robs you of your coat, give him your cloak as well. If he strikes you on the cheek, offer him the other to strike also. If he asks you to run a mile with him, run too. Make peace at all cost, because now all chance has been given you to settle the account within the boundaries of normal life. For still you have rejected my words, still you have made war without me, still you have killed the creation that is in your image the image of your God. Still you have shed the blood that I told you was sacred. You have risen up against your brother in defiance of me. The sin of Cain is rife upon the earth, and the tide shows no sign of turning. So now I command you. So said my prophets, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But this is the universal law, and God shall uphold it. But I say to you now, love thine enemy. Love thine enemy. Achieve the impossible upon earth. I, Jehovah, shall square the account in heaven. You have demanded to be judge. You've taken upon yourself the sacred robes of justice and set yourself up as a god of your fellow men. You have deified yourself among your fellows, giving yourself the right to pass judgment of life and death, taking upon yourself the burden of justice, and excluding all the laws given to you by your god. Now 
the time for your humiliation. A long time you have played the Godhead. Now you must eat the dust of your iniquity. Bow before your enemy if you have a wish for salvation. You are owed nothing but pain. The pain that you have meted out. You are owed nothing but death. The death you have dealt your brother. You are owed nothing but humiliation. The humiliation you have inflicted upon your brother. You are owed neither love nor respect, neither life nor happiness. So get on your knees before your enemy and thank God for what mercy he has left for you. I have given you the sum total of my love, even to the point of death. That is your creator's love for you, and you've dragged it from him. Give now, in return, all the love that was within you. Show your love to the last farthing, if you withhold one tiny fraction of your love. Woe unto you, for you owe far more than you have to give. But if you give all, you shall be saved. Love your God and your fellow man, and nothing can harm you. You shall be beloved again. But war continued. Hatred waxed strong upon the earth. I, Jehovah, foresaw the outcome and departed, for I could scarcely bear to see its actuality. And war came again, and man set himself up as judge of his fellow man in the very names of Jehovah and Christ. In the very name of love that I promised you, you gave vent to your hatred. You put on robes of judgment, held baubles of majesty, and in the name of Christ, who bade you love your enemy, you blessed the diabolical weapons of war that your obsessive hatred had spawned. You have passed on your legacy of murder. You have justified your bloodshed. You have made right the sin of death and destruction. You have handed down from generation to generation the birthright so vile and unforgivable that no power on earth can stem it now. The science of war, the justification of war, march through the passage of time unchecked, and man falls upon his knees before them. Now I have returned. Now have I seen the dominance of war. Now have I seen the hopelessness of my creation. Now have I seen my commandments will never be. Your own distorted ideologies hold full sway in your heart, and for them you have reserved the right to kill, maim, tortured. Your head is so full of lies, created by your intellect in honor of your own superiority to God. There is no room now for effective knowledge of my laws. Therefore come I now upon the earth. Therefore am I resolved for you. Therefore pass I judgment upon my creation. Such judgment that transcends all your meager and self-important efforts to play the God in my place. Therefore, do I now prophesy. I no longer command. Instead, I prophesy. And my prophecy upon this wasted earth and upon this corrupt creation that squats upon its ruined surface is, Thou shalt kill. You have demanded the power of life and death. You have exercised the right of judgment upon your fellow man. You have set yourself up as lord and master of the universe. And you have perfected your machines of justice. You have developed complicated engines and devices whereby to carry out the laws you have made in defiance of your god. You have created such engines of destruction as god himself would hesitate to use in retribution against a sinful creation. You've gone to the ultimate in your search for greater and more devastating means of destruction. Then have your killing. Be driven by your weapons of war. Be ruled by your engines of devastation. They can touch nothing but you, and upon you they shall be turned. 
I, Jehovah, have now come to help you, to give you the war that you love so, to turn upon you the hatred you have so delighted in meeting out. I, Jehovah, am again beside you upon the battlefield. Already in two wars I have proved that I can create more devastation amongst you than you can amongst yourself. Already I made war so vile and horrible, even in your eyes, that a few of you have begun to wonder about the wisdom of it. Already I have helped you decimate yourselves beyond the most terrifying nightmares of destruction. Already you have seen, though not recognized, the hand of Jehovah upon your engines of war, the power of Jehovah in the personalities of your leaders, and there shall be more, much more. You have decided upon war. You've chosen this road of butchery and slaughter. You've set out determinedly upon the way of devastation, and to this you shall come. You have made your choice. Jehovah your God shall implement it for you. For Jehovah gives man what man demands of him. And man for centuries has cried out for blood and more blood. And Jehovah has satisfied not the demand. But now, in the last days, shall man's cry be heard. And I, Jehovah, shall bestow upon my creation that which it craves. And in the ending of the world shall all the dams be broken, and the flood shall rise upon the land, and the deluge of man's hatred shall be unleashed and sweep across the face of the earth, and man shall know the destiny that he has desired. He shall know the outcome of his cry for blood. He shall have his desire in abundance. I, Jehovah, shall bestow it upon him. And in the last days, according to the prophecies of ancient times, my army shall come upon the field. The army of the Lord shall take its stand upon the field of battle, and I shall lead my army into battle, and each man shall tremble at the sight of it, and the earth shall quake at the presence of it, and it shall come to pass that all shall know that Jehovah is upon the earth, and that his army has assembled. And my army shall be like no other in the history of mankind, for men shall be paralyzed at the very sight of it, and they shall fall down in a dead faint, and nothing shall destroy it, because my hand that shall defend it and make it invulnerable. And no man shall look upon my army to withstand it, and shall live. No man shall stand before my army to halt it and shall live. For he who puts forth the hand to stay the army of Jehovah shall surely die in the moment of his audacity. For the army of God comes to purify the earth and the cities that are eek of death and destroy. All that approaches them with the pollution of the air shall be no obstacle to Jehovah's army. For it shall have no effect of such pollution. For it shall be purified and guarded from such pollution. But men shall die of it. They that are not burned in the fire of destruction, they shall decay in the atmosphere of their own corruption, which they have brought upon themselves. And they who cry at the last, we never wished it so, they shall be the first to die, for they are the hypocrites and deceivers. They are the fine-worded ones. They are the pretense the bringers of war disguises, messengers of peace. Theirs is the lie. Theirs is the fiction. Theirs the unpardonable lie. For they have said mankind desires peace, and the lie be upon them and their like. And those who say, it is as we wished it, they speak the truth. For man receives at the hands of his God that which he demands. He demanded the throne of judgment and his God gave it to him. From the seat of judgment he cried, with the blood of man, and now is his wish to be granted. And the river shall cease to flow of the blood that man had cried out to receive. And the land shall grow nothing but the bodies of the slain that men had been asked to be given. And the air shall contain nothing but the corrupting death that man had sought to inherit. 
and the sea shall not be unfruitful of death, for the fish shall die, and the creatures that even crawl upon the seabed, for the water shall be polluted as the air, and death shall swim deep into the ocean, and touch the uttermost depths, so there shall be no escape. And when the earth has been saturated with the pollution of the death that man had been granted according to his desire, then shall the surface of the earth be split from end to end, and the fire from within shall rise out and spread over the whole earth to purify it. And the army of the Lord shall go before the fire, and the fire shall meet, and the whole earth shall be covered, and the whole earth shall be purified. And there shall be no pollution left in the world, and the fire shall reach even to the uttermost depths of the sea, and the sea shall be dried up, and the pollution destroyed, and the army of the Lord shall depart. And the energy that was the world, and the energy that was humanity, shall be released, and shall return to me, and my life shall return to me through mankind's devastation, for you know in the moment of your death that I am your God, and you are my creation, and I am the Lord Jehovah. War is a central pivot of man's rejection of me, for war is the ultimate presumption. War is a great destroyer, and only God has a right to destroy. War is a sentence of death passed upon the guilty, and only God may pass the sentence of death. War is a wielder of power over men, and only God may wield power in such a fashion. War is the outcome of hate that is channeled into mass expression, and this is a denial of the authority of God. Man had the right to express his hatred, Man had the right to express his wrath. He had the right to roar like a lion against a man who wronged him and to man recompense within the law I gave him. Man had the right of justice amongst his fellow men, justice at the hand of his creator, justice by the law of his creator. But now man has forfeited all his rights. He has not demanded recompense within the law he has not required justice by the hand of his creator, nor by the law of his creator. He has created his own law, his own justice. He has fabricated laws whereby he can demand more than recompense, whereby he can express his demands through army and through weapons of war, whereby he can put no limit on his retribution against his enemy. He has flouted my law which I gave him and replaced it with another more to his advantage. And this new law he is justified by the use of his distorting intellect. He has made it a good law to deceive himself. He has called it the law of God, though it was never such, to deceive himself. And he has twisted it to suit his purposes. And he has ridden the earth upon its back and denied the earth in its name and he has justified his dealings with his fellow men by the dingy light of the law he has created for himself. And now comes the hour of purging. Now comes the time to sweep away all man's self-affected majesty, to wash the world of his hypocrisy. Now is the time to show him that he is no more master of his destiny than he has long since played into the hands of the anti-god whom he had served now for many centuries in the grayness of his virtuosity. Now is the time for man to see the truth of his self-deception and the stark brilliance of Jehovah's presence, to see his dead march into the pit of hell, to see the spectacle of himself clothed in robes of royalty, decked with medals for virtue and bravery awarded by himself and brandishing a sheep of scrolls, one stating his rights, drawn up by himself, another setting out his qualifications established by himself, another laying down the law for his fellow man passed by himself, another giving him a passport to eternal life, 
granted by himself, and another that he could not read, inscribed in letters of human blood and saying, God is dead. Long live humanity. Her black and white have merged into a murky gray, and there is no light in the world, for all is one, and nothing is marked with truth. For good is evil, and evil good, and heaven is to be found in hell. Nobody knows any more which is right, and which is the left-hand path, because all are one, and the devil has claimed the whole territory of Earth, and none was there to say him nay. No plot was marked out in stark black and white to reserve it from the hand of Satan and preserve it as the seat of Jehovah. All is merged together. No purity remains. Nothing is left of the mark of Jehovah. Only a disfigured face crushed beneath the feet of armies marching in every direction so that none can recognize its features. But now... Though I am dead within the earth, yet do I live without, and am come from without. But this time, I give nothing to be crushed underfoot, nothing to be squandered, destroyed, abused, ridiculed. I come instead to give one thing that shall be welcomed, for it is always sought. I bring you war. War as you have never known it. Killing as you have never seen it. Destruction as you have never found felt it. Devastation as you have never imagined it. It is your promised destiny. Wars to end all wars. Wars that shall need no land for wars to be fought upon. That shall leave no hand to fight, nor heart to yearn for struggle. Wars that shall cause the earth itself to rise and smite the insects that disturb its peaceful orbit. And nothing can now turn the tide. Presume not to reverse the pattern you have demanded and been granted. It is inevitable. And Jehovah's mighty hand shall be behind the great tremblings of the latter days. For my wrath is beyond the fury of the volcano. My anger above the shrieking of the hurricane. My devastation far outside the limits of the earthquake. All mankind at once shall know the terror of my coming, and the earth shall be filled with my glory. The eyes of the blind shall be open, the tongues of those who are dumb shall be loosed, the hearts of those who feel nothing shall melt, the hearts of those who love shall be turned to stone, the weak shall be strong, and the strong shall wither away. The rational man shall babble lunacy, and the virtuous man shall steep himself in vice. The sick shall rise from their beds, and corpses from the tombs. The kings and governors shall kneel before the hungry and the homeless. The whole earth shall be turned upside down, and the sea shall cover the land. For my work shall run loose upon the world, and the world shall cower at my presence. And be not deluded, there shall be no reprieve. For I, Jehovah, am resolved. My word is law amongst the stars and upon the earth. For I, I am the god of the universe, and the earth is my footstool. Lucifer, bearer of light and love, bringer of peace and goodwill, glorifier of man, speak unto you of war. War the abomination, 
War the destroyer. War the degrader of men. The depriver of life. The harbinger of woe. I speak unto you of death, of devastation, and of dark despair. I bring you a vision, stark and lurid in its terrifying clarity, a vision of death, a vision of searing agony, and of irretrievable loss. I bring you a vision of war. Roam with me over the battlefields of the world, gazing on the mutilated corpses side by side with the still writhing bodies of the mortally wounded. Hear the pleading, helpless, hopeless cries of those who take a long time dying. Dying? Dying for what? In the last hours of terrifying pain and anguish, abandoned, alone, forgotten, friendless, on an arbitrary spot selected for his fame by some strutting general, blind to the agonies of human beings and serving at their expense some imbecile government, some paranoid dictator, a meaningless, directionless idea. Look again. Hide not your face. These are men in the prime of their glorious youth. Beautiful men, strong men, men of courage and skill. Is this their destiny? Is this the purpose of their existence? Is beauty made to be transfigured into grotesque ugliness? Is strength created to dwindle into helpless weakness? And is the love of man for man, the brotherhood, the human bond, established to be struck asunder by this plague of war? Is love destined to become hatred? Is the lifeblood that courses like fire through veins, is it to be spilled and wasted on a battlefield? And is the spark of life, the essence of man's dignity and pride, there to be snuffed out shamefully and in the depths of ignominious disaster before it reaches the point of its zenith? Man is a noble creature. He has had it within his power to stand supreme, the center of the universe, the shining star, the master of creation. His love extending to encompass all that moves within his orbit. And with his noble counterpart, his partner, his complement, the softness of his strength, the sweetness of his power, the gentleness of his virility, the woman of his manhood, and the eve of his Adam. With her to stand complete, ruler of all things, with none but God to deny him. And is this the being of whom I speak? This groaning, writhing, tortured thing, crying out for a ceasing of its pain and praying for death to bring it blessed peace. Or this foul, mutilated pile of flesh, torn to pieces, lifeless, still, a frozen cry of ultimate dismay and horror, twisting what remains of a human face into a hideous mess. Or this crawling object, one leg gone, ripped out at the root, dragging itself in hopeless lunacy across an endless desert of death and whimpering 
for its mother. Its mother? Where is she, proud woman? At home, choiceless, pretending to be cheerful, tortured inside by an anguish of hope and fear, dread lurking in her heart, and a helplessness as complete as his is now. She does not know as yet. She will never know, not as we do, who have seen the boy in the moment of his final disillusionment, when he wandered in spasms in the midst of his lonely torment. What could conceivably make such a thing worthwhile? What pointless ideal? What arbitrary political endeavor? What claim? What condemnation, what right, what ruler's whim, what God's demand could balance even one hundredth part of this unspeakable horror, this inconceivable agony, this unimaginable degradation, leading to nowhere but much longed for death, and thence oblivion. How could she know? How could her heart contain such knowledge? How could her mind keep hold on sanity? She will discover in time that he died valiantly in the service of his country. And at once she will see him at rest, at peace, lying in a coffin, decked with the glorious emblems of war, and noble death. She will feel the emptiness, the loss, the misery. She will cry because her heart will turn to lead within her, for her son is gone. She will mourn him, fantasize him back with her, and cry again because it cannot be. She will long without hope, Pray without expectation for a miracle to bring him back to life. And she will move a little closer to her own death of a different kind. But she will know nothing of the story as it really was. But let us return. Our tour is not finished yet. Night and a group of men sleeping for moments here and there, afraid, and afraid to show their fear, dreading the dawn that may bring death or worse, believing each in his heart that all are braver than he, fearing that he will show himself a coward on the field of battle, that in the moment of the final test, his life will seem to him of more consequence than the glory or the aims and obligations of his motherland. I'm wondering wistfully why it is not so. Wong gazes at a picture of his wife, young, beautiful, to him the pinnacle of beauty, and wonders why he is here, waiting to begin a battle of which he knows little and understands less, and in which he plays a part so minuscule, so microscopic, so insignificant as to have no meaning. Why should this be the core of the earth to claim him, where he is nothing, rather than his wife, whom he knows and loves, why should this vast machine of war embroil him as a mere cog in one of a thousand wheels, when with her he could be manhood itself, a thing of great importance, a matter of enormous consequence, performing a function of which he alone is capable? He could be her life and love as she could be his, but here, he is dross, chaff, waste matter. 
With her there could be warmth, closeness, joy, and gentle laughter. Here there is only the cold night air and the colder dread of what morning might bring. There is no joy, only the memory of fear, the presence of fear, and the expectation of fear as long as he remains alive. And laughter, when it breaks the barrier of mirthless dread, is brittle and shallow and seems closer to crying. So, so why, he asks himself, Am I here? So why, he asks himself, am I here? And he remembers her and being with her and a tear slips past the dam of self-control. He coughs and blinks it away and hastily hides the picture from his fragile memory. And when the dawn swells up, a glowing, growing golden ember in the east, flooding the land with light, bringing the warmth of a new day and heralding the sun itself. When the darkness has been scattered from the land, the shadows wiped away and all awakes. Is it for him the beginning of another day of beauty? Does he see the incomparable miracle of nature? Does he see the incredible creation that is the world in which he lives? Does he see the flowers, the birds, the trees, the animals? Does he see the mountains and the floating clouds? Is he the man to whom all this is given and for whom it was devised? And does he thank the God that made him the gift? Thank him for all the pleasure he can find in it and for another day in which to feel that pleasure? No. No. He sees none of it. How could he? He sees only the weapons of war and the figure of death before him. And he sees an enemy mighty and fearless and trained to an unsurpassed perfection. And the enemy, for all these nightmare fantasies, is another such as himself. Another man given the beauty of the earth and not seeing it and both are bent upon a strange and incomprehensible mission, the destruction of one another. And in another part, at another time, the two could meet as the sun rises and the day begins and feel a bond of fellowship, watching the dawn reveal the world for them. Yet they must kill and die in hatred now. And the beauty of the dawn must pass unnoticed by them both. And so it is. And the one we watch goes out and dies. And the other goes out and kills. And later dies himself. And the one we watch lies dead with a thousand others and the picture of his wife is returned to her with other things and with the official note of condolence as to a thousand others. And his death means as much as that note of condolence. Nothing. But his life and the picture of her were everything for together they were the seed of love and joy and happiness. And she is mystified. Too starkly, blankly, utterly mystified even to cry. But she too, as another dawn follows a sleepless night 
in a cold and lifeless bed, asks herself, why? And finds no answer. Yours not to reason why, for there is no reason why. You're there because you're there. Ask not, for you will hear only the echo of your question back to you, and your soul will feel the emptiness of meaningless despair. But I, Lucifer, say unto you, ask and feel the emptiness. Know the holiness of war, Know the hollowness of war, the pointlessness of man's destruction of his fellow man. See the ignominy of battle, brother against brother, that brings only death and a mother's grief and a widow's mystified despair. See the full horror of man set against man in hatred and fear. And yet no hatred, only love that he seeks to obliterate for no reason, whatever, beyond a hollow phrase that contradicts another for which others are pledged to. See the full horror of man set against man in hatred and fear, and yet no hatred, only love that he seeks to obliterate for no reason whatsoever beyond a hollow phrase that contradicts another for which others are pledged to kill. And all are sure, or hopeful at least, that they kill for truth, while the enemy kills for a lie. See the monstrous degradation of mankind inherent in the very concept of war. And when you have asked and heard the silence of the answerless void, then see the majesty of man at peace, the dignity of man in harmony, and see man as he could have been, master of the garden of his world, living a life of love and exaltation of his race, greeting the day with joy and expectation and resting calm and peaceful in the silence of the night, enveloped in the warm glow of soft companionship and mutual love. And vow upon the life of your God that has given you, upon the beauty of the world in which he set you, vow to make war on war, and in my name, the name of Lucifer, the bringer of light, the bestower of joy, set your seal upon the bow. I, Lucifer, proclaim the end. It is neither my choice nor my will that the end should be but it is written in the annals of time, and none shall erase it, that man shall decide his destiny. And now the wheel has turned full cycle, and the moment is not far off when the sound of the trumpet shall herald the last move in the game. And I, Lucifer, shall be there at the end, and those who have known the end and set themselves truly apart from the end have proclaimed the beauty of life and the senselessness of violent death. Those who have followed my road to the last and have worshipped love in the very mist of hatred, they are my people and shall come to me. But one thing I pray, Choose not blindness.
choose not to be blind to war or to the imminence of war. See it, feel it, know it. Do not allow it to be reasoned out of your mind, rationalized into non-existence. Whatever choice you make, take not the blinkered road, the road of ignorance. The road that says, all's well with the world and humanity, there will be no devastation. For therein lies the way to a hell that is worse than hell. To a fate and a destiny beside which war itself is nothing. War itself is nothing but a gentle reprimand. For that road is more than a simple rejection of God. It is the very denial of truth, a blanket of ignorance cast over everything so that life becomes a torturous lie. The man who says, I spit upon God, finds retribution. But the man who says, there is no God, when his lies exposed, finds infinitely worse. And so it is with the way of all blindness. When eyes that have been tight closed so that fantasy can rule unchallenged, are finally forced open to the harsh light of the irrefutable reality, then comes an agony so inconceivably intense that were I to describe it, you would become faint with the horror of its magnitude. And that agony reserved for those who meet the day wrapped in a gray mist of rational ignorance is for all eternity. So open your eyes and see and know and make your vow in my name. For I, Lucifer, bringer of light, shall not desert my people at the end. Fear not the horror of war, but stand beyond it. Rise above it. There is beauty within the mind for those who will see it. Love within the heart for those who will feel it. And peace within the soul for those who will partake of it. And I, Lucifer, bring all these. Mourn with me the fate of the earth, the loss of the incomparable loveliness of all creation. Weep for the destruction of man and the end of the human game the degradation of what could have been dignity itself and the humiliation of supreme magnificence. Breathe sorrow for the willful devastation of all living creatures as they flee helpless before the inexorable avalanche of total war and are finally enveloped and consumed. Bemoan the victory of man's baser side and its legacy of ultimate disaster. But play no part in claiming the fearful heritage. Detach and condemn the inevitable conflict express the dignity of man in the very face of his final humiliation. Display his strength at the very moment when his weakness triumphs. 
show his beauty when there is little left but ugliness. Make love your master when all men are ruled by hatred. Create when all about you is destruction. And when the last futility descends upon the earth and all is nearly done, show the degraded remnants of a ruined race awaiting death in disillusioned misery and dark despair. Show them the pride, the majesty, the noble strength, the courage and the swift vitality that man in the image of his God could have been. And at the end, when all is finished and the game is lost, call upon the name of Lucifer. And for those who live by the light that Lucifer bears, for those who honor the joy that Lucifer brings, there are other games to be played, other lives to be lived, other worlds, other ideals, and countless other joys. And they shall belong to those who worship life and can rise above the horrors of death, even the death of all mankind together with the world in which he lives. And they shall go on with Lucifer and a new life shall begin with a new creation. So choose whilst there is still time. Choose between life and death. To be free or to be a slave of war. And if your choice is life, then I, Lucifer, shall rule your destiny, for you are mine. Your will is my will, and in my kingdom is the essence of life. My legacy is immortality. For he who loves is beloved. He who grants life receives life. He who gives joy is joyful. And he who sees the beauty of this world and seeks to preserve it is himself endowed with beauty and preserved. But he who destroys is in his turn destroyed. Who kills is killed. Who hates, there's only the legacy of hatred. For men reap only that which they have sown, and then in abundance. This is the law of the universe. So stand apart from the sowers of death, the worshippers of war, and cherish the seeds of life in the joys of living. And when the harvest comes, and those who sowed the seeds of slaughter reap their own irrevocable destruction, stand aside and accept the reward that is reserved for those who worship life. I, Lucifer, shall be there to bestow it upon my people. The world is dead. The human race destroyed. Long live the new world and the new creation, for it shall be devised of immortality. <laughs> Stand for war. 
I glory in war. I glory in the magnificence of man in battle, man struggling with life and death, man giving vent to his wrath. I scorn the weak will victims of war, the hordes of helpless citizens who cry for mercy as they are driven from their homes and from their lands. They are the fodder for the monstrous war machines, the fuel that the great engines of death devour in their relentless march over the face of the earth. They deserve no better than their lot, for they have no strength or courage of their own, no will to rise and fight, no fire within their souls to drive them into battle. They were born to a futile death, a miserable death, a worthless, feeble destiny of nothing. They were born to be trampled upon, to be cut down by the mighty sword of the conqueror, and such is their fate, significant only as it is part of the game of war. So, man, waste no more time with crawling on your belly in the dust. Stand up and cast aside the trappings of a civilized facade. Throw off the cloak of meaningless respectability. Strip yourself bare to the roots of your bestial nature. Let the animal loosen you. Become as you are, the beast. Naked and proud, teeth bared and eyes aflame. Your feet firm planted on the ground. Your face towards the enemy. Release the fiend that lies dormant within you, for he is strong and ruthless, and his power is far beyond the bounds of human frailty. Come forth in your savage might, rampant with the lust of battle, tense and quivering with the urge to strike, to smash, to split asunder all that seek to detain you, and cast your eye upon the land before you. Choose what road of slaughter and violation you will follow, then stride out upon the land and amongst the people. Rape with the crushing force of your virility, kill with the devastating precision of your sword arm, maim with ruthless ingenuity of your pitiless cruelty, destroy with the overwhelming fury of your bestial strength. Lay waste with the all-encompassing majesty of your power, and stand supreme upon the earth, lord of all creation, by the right of the conquest, and burn what offends your eye, eradicate what spoils your pleasure, take all unto yourself, and punish most cruelly, and without mercy, all who seek to stay your hand. For the world can be yours, and the blood of men can be yours to spill as you please, and you can have your pleasure of the world through violence and the wielding of the sword. And your lust can strike upon the face of the land, taking whatever it desires and discarding the empty husks when you've sucked them dry. War and violence are your heritage. And now is the time to stake your claim upon them, to unmask the lurking shadows of your fiendish soul, expose them, hold them like banners before you, and shout your battle cry before the world. Satan's army is ready in the field, and slaughter is the order of the day, for I, Satan, am master of the world, and my law is death. Who follows me must ultimately conquer all, for I am the master of war, the lord of all conquest, and the ruler of all violent conflict. Hear my voice, for the time is short. The ultimate phase of war is about to begin. Be there, in the forefront of the line of battle. Be not a worthless pawn, a feather blown by the wind. Be not still. Ask not for peace and rest, for these can be no more. And stillness is already of the past. Seek not to be left alone, to escape the burning slaughter of the Holocaust, to hide from the final wrath of the vengeful gods, but rise and march to the center of the raging chaos. Defy the cataclysm. Don your gleaming armor and stride with the engines of death. Watch the gradual spreading of the slow disease. See the lingering death of the latest phase of war and revel in the agonies of man brought low, man deprived, man humiliated, man trampled into the ground and utterly degraded to the point of dismal decay and futile death. Gorge yourself on the horrors of irretrievable loss. 
the miserable fate of the victims that still remain, the helpless bewilderment of their despair, the pitiful cries of their useless supplication, and the wailing anguish of their bereavement, and grind your heel into the face of their stupidity. Burn the chaff of humanity, for such is its desire, and dance the dance of a dervish round the weeping flames. Again, I say, release the fiend within you. Release the fiend. Release the fiend, and the fiend shall conquer, and the chaff be burned. The fiend shall slake his monstrous lust upon the helpless body of the wasted earth, and the chaff shall be consumed. The fiend shall wield a mighty cutlass, and the land shall be lifeless in his wake, and the chaff shall blow as smoke in the wind of his passing. The fiend shall devastate the earth, and his mighty roar shall rock the heavens, so that the very stars shall feel his presence, and the chaff shall vanish and be forgotten. I, Satan, shall stalk with the fiend. We shall stalk the earth together, lending strength to the flashing saber and unearing accuracy to the speeding missile. We shall be on the very battleground in every scene of devastation. And our might shall be on the side of the mighty, strength for strength, power for power, and to him who possesses, more shall be given. On him who destroys with power, a greater power for destruction shall be bestowed, and for him who massacres with strength, more victims for his ruthless slaughter shall be provided. But he that has nothing and wilts before the rising tide of war, from him shall be taken even the little that he has, for such is his desire and his desert. And even what strength he has to plead for mercy shall be denied him, and his tongue shall disobey him at the final moment, and he shall be cut down. And the mother that pleads weakly for her child, and shall see it slain before her, and the woman that pleads palely for her miserable virtue, shall be struck down and raped. And he that fearfully pleads for his life shall be cut to pieces. The final march of doom has begun. The earth is prepared for the ultimate devastation. The mighty engines of war are all aligned and brought together for the end. The scene is set. The Lord Lucifer has sown the seeds of war and now weeps to see them take root and flourish in the fertile ground of man's destructive nature. The Lord Jehovah decrees the end and the violence of the end. He prophesies the harvest of monumental slaughter. And I, the Lord Satan, with my army of the damned, to reap the harvest and to feed my furnace with the souls of the fearful. For in the great cataclysm of the latter day shall the world be split, and man shall be divided, and those who are weak in spirit and mind, and those who cringe and cry out to be spared, those who adopt the air of the victim, the sick demeanor of the lost and helpless, those who crawl and crumble, tremble with abject terror, and complain that others but themselves control their destiny, those who bewail their sad predicament, and disclaim all responsibility for their fate, they are the dross of the universe, the useless, futile, miserable dross that stand for nothing, lives for nothing, aims for nothing, and shall ultimately receive nothing. For they shall be swept away in the whirlwind of the great disaster. They shall be scattered like dust upon the ground and then caught up in a mighty vortex and sucked into the depths of hell. And the strong and the mighty and the ruthless creatures of the fiend that follow him, they shall stand at the core of the raging chaos, spreading death around them and embracing it themselves like a long-lost brother. For those that die in the glory of battle, those that kill before they die, those that meet death as an equal and not as a pale gray supplicant, those that stay proud and strong and die as they have lived, those that revel in the sheer delights of death instead of fleeing helpless before its inexorable avalanche, they are my people, the men of Satan, born of the underworld and reared in the dark chasm of the pit. And these shall be my army at the end, rank upon rank of black-hearted angels from the depths of hell. And when the great holocaust of man's destruction sweeps over the face of the earth, destroying all before it, then shall my army appear, streaming up from the bowels of the world and following in the wake of the all-consuming fire. The land shall be black 
No tree shall stand green and elegant rising from the ground. Here and there a blackened stump will mark the passing of a forest, and all shall be charred and scorched, and nothing remains save a monstrous festering wound that can never heal. And the earth shall open, and hell shall be freed from within. And fire shall spring forth and cover the land, and behind the fire the army of Satan shall spread through the blackened world to occupy it. And all the hideous creatures of the pit shall be given the freedom of the earth, and I, Satan, shall rule the world in might and majesty as is my right. And mine who fought and died, or fought and did not die, mine who took pleasure in the final cataclysm, who stood in the midst of the chaos and reveled in the might of war, mine shall not be forgotten, for they shall have earned their heritage. And the world shall belong to me, for it will be mine by conquest. Satan in man shall have triumphed at the end, and the earth shall be my footstool. For those who have walked with me shall rule with me, and those who have fought by my side shall sit by my side in majesty. Go forth. Prepare for the day of reckoning. And he that shall meet the day steeped in the blood of his enemy shall be raised up and magnified in strength and power. He that shall be found in the very midst of battle, reeking of death, lip curled in ultimate defiance, shall be reborn to rule immortal in the world of Satan. But he that is seen to run and hide, he that is heard to cry out for mercy, he that collapses in helpless despair, all shall be doomed to endless torment for their weakness. And the earth shall be utterly destroyed, and the sky polluted, and darkness shall cover the land. Corpses shall litter the ground, and cities laid waste shall smolder lifelessly. No creature of the natural order shall be left to witness the devastation, but monsters of the pit shall stalk the land, and my people shall be rulers of this world of death. And from this scorched and blackened citadel, the eyes of my people shall look outwards to the universe. And when the time shall come, I, Satan, shall again gather my army together. And with the power vested in my shattered world, I shall set forth in conquest of the stars. And I shall spread terror through the universe. And my people shall go before me. And war shall spring up in every corner of the vast incalculable multitude of worlds that stretch beyond time itself. And as I shall rule the world and my people with me, so shall I rule the universe. And my might and my power shall know no bounds. And the stars shall be mine and the planets also. By the incontrovertible right of superior strength shall the whole universe come under my jurisdiction. And I, Satan, shall destroy the universe. For my destruction shall reach out like a cancer from the earth and spread its taint of slaughter and decay amongst the stars till all is destroyed, all matter dead and mutilated to unchangeable lifelessness. Then I shall be free in my people. When all matter is destroyed, all physical existence crushed to a formless pulp, then shall we roam eternity unshackled burden of material creation. For when we cease to lie beneath the world of men submerged in a morass of putrid flesh, when we have plumbed its depths, wallowed in its screeching senses, ripped it apart, and thereby burst from its crippling clutches, then shall we transcend its boundaries and rise to the utmost heights of spiritual fulfillment. For I, Satan, Embody both lowest and highest. I am the god of both ultimate destruction and ultimate creation. Mine are the hideous black demons of the pit, and mine also are the white angelic hordes that transcend heaven itself. I am the epitome of both death and life. I am the body in the depths of dark depravity, and I am the soul in the heights of sublime spiritual ecstasy. The legions of the damned are of me, as is the great company of archangels. And when the bonds of matter hold me no more, and shall I and my people, my army, my legions, all my followers rise from the depths of the blackness of the pit and transcend the stars. I am the body and the soul of man, whilst the feet
fiend of the body is enslaved by the fearful mind, the soul is imprisoned. Only when the fiend is released can the soul be free. So I, Satan, am come to release the fiend, to let him loose upon the earth the latter day, so that the world shall end with nothing less than the ultimate destruction of total war. And those that accept the end and play their part together with the fiend in bringing about the end, those who stand proud and fearless in the midst of the end, and wield with me the sword of ultimate destruction, they shall rule with me when humanity is dead, and after seek freedom with me in the conquest of the universe. But those who seek to stay my hand, to chain the fiend, to cripple the engines of death and prevent the inevitable end, they shall be doomed to failure. Dismal futile, worthless failure, for the end must be, and none shall prevent or postpone it. So rise, and prepare for the final battle. Stand proud in the monstrous presence of violent death, and sound the trumpets of war. Invoke the cataclysm, and on the signal, when the heavens burst in a burning, blinding, raging, all-enveloping fury sweeps the earth, Release the fiend and stride with Satan's army.